Hello, I'm Robert Nichols from the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research at the University of East Anglia. And I want to make a few high level points on managing flood risk in the UK. When we think about climate change, it exacerbates flooding in different ways, uh, it, be it um, more intense precipitation, overwhelming uh, infrastructure and, and drainage systems, uh, more intense precipitation and higher runoff, um, having effects on flows and increasing flows in ch river channels, or sea level rise exacerbating flooding in our coastal areas. Um, I'm going to draw um, on coastal examples in particular in this, uh, in this illustration of the points I'd like to make, um, but I think the points can be made more generally to all the issues of flooding um, in the UK. First of all, to think about the history of floods, and particularly coastal floods to illustrate that, there's a long history. And if we look at the Surge Watch database, we can find floods going back to 1099, nearly a thousand years ago, still being remembered. 1607, 2000 deaths around the Bristol Channel in a major coastal flood event. The 1953 flood, which um, really probably is the benchmark really for our coastal flooding issues today and the one that's talked about most with no, over 300 deaths in England uh, and Scotland due to the coastal flood itself. And then when it's combined with the 1947 Thames flood, which was the worst flood in the Thames catchment in the, in the 20th century, this is a sort of nationally significant moment when really things started to change um, in terms of our views of flooding and a transformation of our understanding of flooding uh, happened, which I think is continuing today. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But floods keep on going. And 60 years after 1953, we had the 2013 flood, which was quite a similar event. We had a warning system, so we were ready for this event. We had much, much better uh, flood defences um, than we had at uh, in 53. So there were no people were killed, no loss of life, but there was still damage. And for example, the port of Immingham um, was badly hit, which is the largest port in terms of car cargo tonnage moved uh, in the UK. And um, it still reminds us of the vulnerabilities of flooding, even though we were better repaired in 2013. So floods have happened and they'll continue to happen. And really what we need to be thinking about with our sort of goal of adaptation to flooding is to manage these events better. So we can probably avoid a lot of them, but we still, we're gonna get some floods and we have to manage those events better. Our understanding of floods has improved as I've made the point um, since 53, and we now have excellent forecast and warning services. So we really know when floods are coming and we have an expectation about floods and information that means we can behave differently that we never had uh, in earlier times. We've got to move from just treating floods as being the water, a high river flow, a high sea level, to looking at the floods as a system where we recognise that we can have you know, climate induced effects, sea level rise, higher flows, um, changing the hazard can cause an increase in flooding. But if we upgrade defences, or equally if defences uh, deteriorate, we can also have a change in the risk. If we build more buildings in the, in the floodplain, so more urban expansion, that will increase the number of receptors, that will increase the flood risk. And we, I think, therefore, begin to recognise that when we think about adaptation to flooding, we, um, there's many ways of doing this. It's not just about defence. We have developed national scale perspectives on, on, on flooding and national data on flooding, things that are supporting, for example, the CCRA3, a report just being produced for that. And we have much more structured and complete management approaches for flooding. For example, shoreline management plans in, in, in the coastal zone, strategy studies are, are, are sitting above projects, or the innovative Thames Estuary 2100 project, which takes an adaptive management approach to London's flood risk um, with the high uncertainties of sea level rise and also flows down the Thames. So what is actually happening and how can we sort of characterise and think about um, flooding? Well, if we take this paper, it identified a number of barriers to flooding, and I want to use these to sort of cast a, a, a lens, if you like, on what's going on. It identified technical barriers, economic barriers, 
financial barriers and social conflict issues um, in terms of adaptation to, well, to stick to coastal flooding in this case, I'll apply it more generally. If we look at um, the IPCC sort of approach to coastal flooding, which could be applied, I think, in, to all sort of cases, really, we can recognise that we can do planned retreat, we can um, do flood proofing, we can, we can raise buildings uh, above the flood levels, or we can do protect, we can actually try and build barriers and keep, um, keep the water out. And when we look at the measures we have available to accomplish these goals, here we have memory, um, where as a large managed realignment and the Aselzi bill, or we have new building codes, which mean that when we build in the floodplain, we elevate our um, buildings above the flood level and make an allowance for climate change here in this buildings in the coastal floodplain for sea level rise. Or we can think about protection, um, be it um, the North Port Sea defences here or the Thames barrier below and flood warnings. I mean, I mentioned this already, but uh, flood warnings have greatly improved and uh, again are an important part of our response um, to, to floodings. So in terms of sort of, we can still innovate with technical measures uh, and we are innovating, um, but we have a large um, portfolio of options available to us now. So I don't think there are any particular technical barriers. When we think about economic barriers, there's the, the issue of, is it worth building, um, doing something about flooding? And we have these manuals that, have, that sort of developed over the last sort of 40 uh, or 50 years um, about how we appraise um, uh, whether it's or not it's worth doing a flood alleviation. So really, is it worth protecting? Is the cost of the defence more than the cost of the um, damages we're avoiding. And this really allows us in a very consistent and transparent way to actually make decisions on how we spend um, government money uh, on this, you know, or in fact, any money uh, or, or, or on these issues. And so we find that in many places, you know, there, it is worth defending um, against, um, against flooding but not um, everywhere. And then when we move on, we're again thinking about government sort of funding, financial barriers, um, can we finance this? Well, if we just look to government um, and the grant in aid, um, be, the, 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 the actual um, to be actually uh, funded, a project has to have a cost benefit that's much greater than, than one uh, under the current rules. And I suppose this does raise an interesting question that if we do believe the benefit cost um, numbers that are coming out of, 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 of these analyses, um, then um, that means that schemes that, sh that, that might be justified um, are not being funded. So it does raise the interesting question about finance. Also, it raises the question about finance um, of non-defence uh, measures. Um, what happens when we can't defend? Um, where uh, uh, and typically that hasn't been funded in the past, although there have been some 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 limited funding in these areas. That's something maybe we need to be thinking more about. If we take a sort of a typical town, a coastal town. Um, like Yarmouth, a small town on the Isle of Wight. Here is a coastal flood, 10th of March, 2008. And we can actually do analyses and look at what might happen in the future. Let's imagine a half meter of sea level rise. And here we can see the town, um, which is built in a pretty good place. And it's, most of the town is above the, the, the floodplain, but close to the sea and a harbor. The green areas are the expansion of the floodplain with a half meter rise in sea level. And we start to see that the flood water gets increasingly penetrates the, the um, commercial heart of Yarmouth, where all the tourism uh, and, and sort of uh, recreational activities are, are concentrated. And the water in the blue areas is getting deeper, essentially about half a metre deeper with this scenario. And can we protect, um, can we protect Yarmouth? Um, for against the scenario, quite difficult under the current um, rules actually to 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 to, to put together a, a flood defence scheme here, and that's very common around um, the, the 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 coast, and so um, can, it raises the question: Do we want to do we need, can we actually capture um, 
other values um and you know so I, th I think the finance aspect of what we do here is very important even be it we protect or be it we retreat because we need to retreat in a more sort of in, a, in an intelligent and sensible manner um and that, that maybe raises the question of social conflict because these areas that are not protected and um, this report by the climate change committee uh, identified that in shoreline management plans about about um, 500 kilometers of coastline that was down in shoreline management plans to hold the line, implying they'd be protected, under current rules would not be justifiable to be protected. And, you know, Fairborn here in Wales, or the poster child, because this is really the one place of those that's where, where they've identified that they're going to move Fairborn back over the next um, 50 or so years. This is a place where we're going to have managed realignment or managed retreat of, uh, of a community. But this CCC report implies there are many other areas um, where this is, is, the, is, is the case. And um, how are we going to handle this? This is a sort of a problem that we can see coming and we haven't really um, addressed that terribly well. So what priorities and additional activity uh, are needed? And I should say, I mean, I think that the transformation in uh, flood, flood, flood management that's going on, taking place, including dealing with climate change, um, I'm assuming that this continues. So I'm assuming that, that the activities that we see um, could continue forward with time. And I really want to emphasize where I think particularly additional effort might be uh, useful. So I think one is this issue of precipitation intensity, um, because we see that um, with climate change, we would expect to have more intense precipitation events. And that raises the question of um, building codes, because every building and every sort of community will experience this more intense precipitation. Are we building um, appropriately for these future conditions? And um, when we renew things, are we renewing appropriately? So I think that is something that really needs quite a lot of thought uh, in a three degree world. Another thing is compound flooding. That, that is, we do a good job of looking, thinking about flooding um, from the sea, flooding from high river flows, et cetera. What happens, for example, in the top of an estuary where we may have um, high river flow and high sea levels happening at the same time? That's the example of compound flooding. It's certainly an issue in London with the Thames uh, and, and the North Sea interacting, but it's an issue right round our coast. And in many places, um, we can have uh, more than one source of flooding acting together. We need to understand that and do something about it. Nature-based adaptation, there's a huge amount of interest in trying to use nature to adapt. This is a priority within COP26, the climate change meeting that will happen next year in Glasgow. And I think we now have the tools to really think through and quantify what nature-based adaptation can do and how much we can avoid needing artificial gray infrastructure to protect uh, against flooding. Although I don't think we can substitute nature-based adaptation entirely for gray uh, uh, de defenses, but we can maybe um, have a partial um, replacement. I think we need to think more about the use of adaptive management approaches, particularly um, in coastal areas, because sea level rise is highly uncertain and therefore having an approach that's flexible to that uncertainty is particularly useful, but it may be more widely useful for in other settings. I think adaptation finance needs to be thought through much more, um, you know, and, and how we can put together um, as well, not just thinking about grant in aid, but thinking about how we can put together um, portfolios of funding and thinking about areas that won't be protected. How can we manage the issue of adaptation where we're thinking about some form of essentially retreat? Um, I think that leads to, a, to thoughts about a move away from a line perspective, which is kind of a classical engineering perspective. It's where we sort of started to maybe a more resilient community perspective, again, especially on the coast, because I, because of, um, uh, as I'll see in a moment, sea level rise will continue uh, into the future, even if we have, even with a three degree rise in temperature, uh, the, the sea level doesn't stop rising. Um, and 
the, the resilient community perspective recognizes that you know if we lose for example the, the heart of Yarmouth um, the rest of Yarmouth might be um, not being flooded but we may have lost the, com the heart of the community and so how can we sustain a community in an area where we can't necessarily protect so it's a general sort of problem i think we more broadly need to think about residual risk as well because in those areas we do protect um, what happens if a defense fails and unfortunately if you defend there's always a residual risk and again particularly in coastal areas because the sea keeps on rising if we do get failure the floodplain will be flooded, the floodplain will be larger and will be flooded to a greater depth with water entering at higher velocity. So I think that is something to really be concerned about. And, you know, even though it might be prudent to protect today, maybe in the longer run, maybe we think we don't want to protect these areas. So there are some interesting sort of questions there. I haven't got the answers, but these are issues that need to be thought through. And to make this point about the coast, with three degrees of, of climate change, um, of, of temperature rise, we'd expect um, uh, that then the um, sort of the climate in terms of temperature and precipitation to stabilize if we're assuming sort of stability at three degrees. Um, with um, sea level rise though, if we stabilize global temperature, sea level keeps on rising. And that's what this picture here shows in that um, we have, um, uh, information up to 2100 um, with an RCP 8.5. That's a sort of, you know, that's a sort of a high end um, rise in temperature, four or five degrees global rise in temperature, more than three degrees. And RCP 2.6, which is something like the Paris Agreement. So it's some, somewhere in the ballpark of sort of two ish degrees global temperature rise. And the blue line, even though we're having the Paris Agreement being followed, the, the sea level is still rising and maybe by the end by 2100 it's sort of a half meter and as we move forward to 2200 the sea keeps on rising uh, and by 2300 it's still rising with with three degrees it would be a larger rise in sea level and it makes the point that in in coastal areas the risk will continue to rise for our children our grandchildren and thereafter. So we'll always have to think about a commitment to adapt in these areas. So that's why I stress residual risk um, in coastal areas. So thinking about limits to adaptation, um, well, individual measures may be limited, but I think when we think of more holistically, there are no limits to adaptation in uh, to flooding as planned retreat is an option. So as long as we recognize that and, and think far ahead and recognize those places where retreat is an adaptation, then we, we have the measures that we need. The use of them is a challenge, I think, uh, but certainly we have transformed how we manage flooding since the 1950s. And I think with climate change, we must continue this transformation. And hopefully I've identified a few of the issues I think that might well be focused on. Thank you very much.